Good afternoon and welcome to CMC Markets on Friday the 2nd of April um, and this Good Friday 2021. Um, thanks for turning up for those of you who've, uh, who aren't, who haven't got anything better to do, <laughs> unlike, unlike myself, um, to cover this payrolls report for March and it's an eagerly anticipated one. Um, certainly I think that it's going to be a significant market mover whether or not it's a market mover today or next week obviously is a moot point nonetheless i think expectations for this payrolls report are so high that i think anything less than a fairly decent number could well see a little bit of dollar weakness given the run-up that we've seen over the course of the past few days and it's a bit of a strange report simply on the basis that it's on a market holiday so any market reaction is probably going to be slightly more um, marked than is normal given the thin liquidity conditions and the fact that i would imagine us markets will probably close earlier than they normally do on a friday so this payrolls report comes with an enormous risk warning in that it's obviously a bank holiday and we're also heading into a weekend and there's also a bank holiday in europe on monday as well so um while i don't think the report will change the overall direction or the bullish nature of equity markets it could have a significant effect in the short to medium term over the course of the past two days we've already seen some significant weakness in the dollar from the from the highs that we saw earlier this week. Euro dollar had a little bit of a, a peak below 117. CMC dollar index, which we've got here, um, topped out in and around this series of peaks here, around about 972, just short of the 200 day moving average. More importantly, the dollar index. The US dollar index has also shown a little bit of short term uh, weakness as well. If we look at this Bloomberg chart here on this candle on, on this candle chart where we've had a little bit of a doji here and then we've had a, a, a very strong down candle here. Now, at the moment, we're round about the lows of the last two or three days. And certainly I think the resistance level on euro dollar. I would put probably at slightly higher levels than where we currently are at the moment. Um, if we look at, say, for example, 117.80 area on this chart here, and I'll blow it up for you, um, we can see that we've seen a fairly decent reversal of these lows here. We've come back above 117.50, which for me was a key level on the way on the move down. We haven't been able to sustain that down move which makes me a little bit cautious about a possibility that we may get a move back to 118.70 in the short to medium term. So the big question is what's going to cause that? Um, certainly, I think in terms of US 10-year yields and what we saw yesterday, we did see a significant weakening in the US 10-year Treasury yield. Um, obviously, the highs from earlier um, this week on the Monday at 177.40, since then we've come back a little bit if i make that year to date we can see that's a very strong downward thrust there which would appear to suggest that for all the talk of two fiscal stimulus packages this year one in one in one in january one end of one, one end of december paid in january and um obviously the 1.9 trillion dollar one that was signed off in the middle of march And then we're also talking about a, an infrastructure stimulus plan of around about two trillion dollars as well. Now, of that plan, I think there's been an awful lot of what I would call bullishness around that infrastructure plan. But for me, I think the political um, imperative to get that across um, through Congress is likely to be a very, very arduous affair. So even while the prospect of a two trillion dollar stimulus, a fiscal um, infrastructure stimulus sounds good on paper. I think the practicalities of it could take a while to deliver. 
So I think for me, it's really about does today's payrolls number meet the expectations that have been set to it? And I've heard a whole host of various estimates of what today's payrolls number could be. If we look at the data that we've seen thus far this week, um, it's certainly been very, very positive. I, th I don't think I don't think we can really I don't think we can really dispute that. If you want to read about uh, my preview of the payrolls number, it's actually on the insights section right here. I've also posted a copy of it on the website. So if you want to basically have a quick read through that, basically all I'm going to be talking about um, in the lead up to these payroll numbers is what I've outlined in that preview that I posted out or sent out around about 10.45 uh, this morning. Ultimately, the consensus, the range of consensus estimates for payrolls is as low as 250 and as high as 900,000. So that's quite a that's quite a big range. I mean, basically, if that was a price, you could drive a bus through it. Um, certainly, I think expectations are high, given where the US economy is right now. But also what the expectations are going forward. Let's face it, we've got a one point nine trillion dollar fiscal stimulus checks probably hit the mats of American households. Um, around about two weeks ago, we've seen consumer confidence in the US jump to 109.7. And this week's manufacturing ISM reports um, were very, very positive um, with a headline number, which came in at its best level since 1983, where the prices paid component was 85.6 and where the employment component came in at a three year high. So certainly going to see a positive jobs number. It's really just a question of how big and um, whether or not it's priced in. So I would argue that even if we get a good number today, we will still need to see good numbers in April, good numbers in May, and good numbers in June, because we still remain around about 9 million jobs light from where we were um, February last year. Um, when the unemployment rate was around about three and a half percent. So um, <clears throat> what are my expectations? Well, as I say, I've outlined them. The, the, the general consensus is 660,000. On top of the 379,000 that we got in February and the upgraded 166,000 that we saw in January. More importantly, we're expecting the unemployment rate to fall from 6.2 to 6 percent. Now, if you want to have a look at what the consensus expectations are, they're in the market calendar, which is in the drop down menu from the news and analysis section there. And we can see we can see that quite clearly outlined here. These are the numbers in question for today right at the bottom. Now, average earnings, average earnings. I would expect that to come down. Why? Because if we see a big jump in the payrolls report um, to to say six, seven hundred thousand. A large part of those jobs are probably going to be at the lower end of the pay scale. So that will then bring the average earnings number down from last month's 5.3% to 4.5. So if the average earnings figure comes down, it generally means that an awful lot of the jobs that are coming back are generally at the lower end of the pay scale. That's not a bad thing. Most of the hits to the employment market, the labor market, happened at the lower end of the pay scale. So we want that number to come down. We want it to come down quite substantially. Um, in terms of non-farm payrolls, 647 from 379. Watch for a revision to the February number as well. Um, there was an awful lot of cold weather, which may have affected the February number. So that could actually um, see an upward revision. And actually, the headline number could actually be lower. So you sort of have to. There is there is also a little bit of weather related effects in those numbers as well. And we do need to be prepared for that. Um, overall work week hours, um, 34.7, hoping for that to go up um, generally as a result of the labor market. It generally tends to mean that people um, are, are working more and as, as the as the economy continues to reopen. And obviously the unemployment rate 
expected to come down from 6.2% to 6%. But what I want to see with respect to that is for the unemployment rate to come down and the participation rate to go up. A year ago, the participation rate was 63.4%. It's now sitting at 61.4% because an awful lot of people dropped out of the labor force and aren't claiming for unemployment benefits. So they're not counted in the unemployment rate numbers. Um, so hopefully that gives you an idea um, of what we are expecting vis-a-vis -vis the numbers. And hopefully um, that will then give us some indication of what might happen in the event of a, of a shortfall. Personally, I think looking at the way the S&P is trading at the moment on the futures, we closed yesterday at 40.20. We're already trading 13 points higher on the basis of expectations. And to be quite honest, now that we're above 4,000, I certainly think we can continue to go higher. So it, very may, it remains very much a case of equity, where equity markets are concerned by the dip. Um, we haven't changed that narrative. That narrative has been pretty much the same for the last 12 years, albeit a little bit of a few terrifying sell-offs like we saw all the way back in February last year, bottomed out in March. I mean, that's a big move there. And look, we're well above it. I just wish we were well above it on the FTSE 100 as well. I'm still bullish on the FTSE 100. I still think we'll see 7,000 this year. Um, I think uh, when you look at the UK and you look at the US, they're pretty much leading the recovery um, in terms of the G7. Europe remains very much a concern going forward, though that doesn't appear to be stopping the DAX at the moment. And something happened yesterday, I think, in terms of the overall bullish narrative when it comes to US stocks. And I still think US stocks are probably a little bit pricey. Um, and that's me being polite. Um, for me, it's not really about what I feel in terms of how expensive or how cheap valuations are. The fact that NASDAQ is now back above the 50 day moving average for me generally tends to suggest that we'll probably go and have another go at the highs that we saw in February. Purely on the basis of technicals, I am very, very much driven by technicals. I think it's an easy way for me to declutter my mind um, when it comes to trying to make sense of what markets are doing. Because I think one of the things that we as traders, and my background is in FX, I used to trade currencies, sometimes you need to declutter um, all of the information that's coming into your head because it's pulling you in all different directions. And I think that for me is the most important thing. Um, more than anything, as a trader, you need to declutter your mind and just focus on what is important to you. And what's important to me is the technicals. What's the price doing? Where's the flow going? Is there more sellers than buyers? Is there more buyers than sellers? So I think that for me, more than anything else, is the way I maintain uh, where, where, where I maintained a discipline when I was trading spot FX, I used to trade dollar yen and, um, and, and, a, bit, and, and a bit of cable and dollar mark. Um, and that gives you an indication of how long ago that was. Um, but nonetheless, those skills never leave you. Whatever market you trade, if you have a good sound um, technical base to work off and good risk management skills, then generally, um, you should, if you're disciplined enough, and discipline and risk management isn't the cornerstone of everything, should come out ahead. So in terms of market reaction to what we can expect, one of the things I have noticed is dollar yen. Dollar yen, as the yen's weakened, equity markets have gone very, very well bid. And certainly in terms of a proxy for risk, dollar yen is as good as any. Um, if you risk off, the yen strengthens and the dollar, do dollar goes down. If risk is on, and the dollar goes up and the yen weakens and the yen has weakened a lot but there is a risk i think at the moment that even though i still expect dollar yen to go a little bit higher to around about 111.70 and all the way back to this series of highs through here um, we could be near the top in the short term and in the bottom term and we also have to basically bear in mind what us yields are doing if us if us yields soften then gold should go up if us yields go up gold will go down. It's a bit of a seesaw effect on gold, and you can certainly see that borne out by the way that US bond yields have gone from 0.9% at the beginning of the year to levels of where they are now.
So let's go, let's get ready for the numbers because they're coming out shortly. Um, as I say, just a quick recap. Um, let's look at the dollar reaction of any particular move in relation to the numbers. But as I say, expectations are set very, very high. Some houses are setting or expecting a number in the region of eight or 900,000. So if it comes in short, obviously what will happen is we'll just revise that out into April or May. It doesn't change the overall direction of travel when it comes to the US jobs market. It's about what's currently priced in. And at the moment, I think there's an awful lot of optimism priced in. Um, and as such, we might see a little bit of softening in US yields in the aftermath of the numbers as they hit the tape. So as I say, we've got just under a minute to go um, and, until the numbers. In the aftermath of the numbers, obviously, if you want to ask me any questions, please feel free to do so. I will try and answer them to the best of my ability. Unfortunately, the only markets that are open are the US 30, the S&P 500, the NASDAQ and the small caps. As I've said you know, in my previous summary, it remains very much a case of buy the dips. Um, and um, as I say, a, a weaker number could actually see the dollar soften a little bit uh, along with yields. Um, but in, in the meantime, um, I will um, I will get ready. I will get ready and stay quiet um, because in around about 15 seconds, the numbers will hit the tape and I will try and make sense of them as best I can. As I say, keep an eye out for revisions as well, because they could actually be particularly important when it comes to the numbers. Anyway, I'm micing off now and I'll be back in about 15, 20 seconds. Well, that's a bit of a number, isn't it? 916,000 in non-farm payrolls. Um, the unemployment, the average earnings numbers come down quite significantly as well, which is good. Revised upwards for 468. I mean, there's nothing not to like about that particular number. It's pretty much beating expectations across the board. The revision is even better, and the unemployment rate has fallen to 6%. I mean, that is broadly extremely positive. And you would have expected the dollar to have ex to have strengthened quite strongly on the back of that. So those high expectations were very well justified on the basis of the um, narrative that we've seen thus far this week, and really does bode well, I think, in terms of where we can expect uh, the markets to pick up early next week. Strangely enough, I'm just looking at the 10-year yield at the moment. It's just ticking up a little bit. It's one basis point higher, around about 168.07, but it's not really racing away. Uh, and that would suggest to me that by and large, it's yes, this is a good number, and some of the numbers being banded about were very, very good. Um, but nonetheless, I think that's generally a dollar positive number, and um, it's also a very positive number for equity markets in general. And you're certainly seeing that on the basis of the S&P 500. There's nothing not to like about that. It's very positive for risk, very positive for yields, even though we're not really seeing much of an effect on the yield, but we're certainly seeing a significant effect in the US dollar as a whole. Does anyone have any questions on any of the numbers? Because I think I've pretty much summarized um, how, how decent those numbers are. I don't think there's really too much else to say. Um, if anyone wants me to talk about any of the other markets that um, I haven't currently covered, but uh, by and large, very positive number and bodes well also for next week's ISM services report, the ISM non-manufacturing non non number. Easy for me to say or not to say, what have you. Um, the, yeah, the, um, the ISM non-manufacturing number, because that would suggest to me that an awful lot of those jobs that have been added back are in the, in the services sector um, pretty much. That's borne out by the drop that we saw in the average earnings numbers from four point, from 5.2 to 4.2, a one percentage point drop. Um, so without actually reading the report myself, I can't really do that while I'm watching the markets. I would argue that essentially we're probably going to see euro dollar drift back down to around about 117, uh, 30, 40, 
K will potentially drift back down to around about 138, 137.90. But um, um, overall, very, very positive number. But it begs the question of how much has already been priced in and the way that trading is going at the moment. I think it's unlikely we're going to see much in the way of FX moves, but we're certainly seeing big moves in equity markets. If we look at the S&P, we, we like that an awful lot. If I change that to a very short term chart, that basically tells you really all you need to know on that particular one. And um, the, for those of you of certain age, you remember Yaz, the only way is up by the looks of it in terms of where we go to over the course of the next few days and weeks. Questions, ladies and gents. I'm here to talk about um, questions and what have you. If you uh, if you don't have any, that's great. But um, right, do I think the Fed could potentially raise rates if the strength of the numbers continues in the next few months? Yeah, I mean that is a really really good question, um, and it's certainly something that could start to get priced in. At the moment, the way that equity markets are reacting, I think they're pretty sanguine about that. I think if we want to see early signs that the market's starting to price in a rate hike, we we shouldn't be looking at the 10-year because I still think that the 10-year can go towards 1.8% and potentially 2%. It's going to be what the two-year does. Um, so at the moment, interest rate expectations are very well anchored at the short end of the curve. The danger for the Fed will be, and I'll show you here what I'm looking at. This is a two-year yield chart on the US two on the US two-year. If we start to break up above 0.18 or 0.2% on the two-year, that could just be the um, worry that triggers a potential move in terms of a Fed rate hike before 2024. It's also important in terms of the narrative around a Fed rate hike because of comments that Raphael Bostic has made. They may not hike rates, they may pare back their bond buying program. There are other ways to tighten apart from rate raising rates. They can basically cut, cut down the number of bonds that get by. So I think the narrative really is if interest rate expectations in the short end start to get to, to move higher, that will worry the Fed. Now, next week's minutes could give an indication of the type of discussion that's going on or has been going on with respect to some of the more hawkish members of the committee and obviously the doves like Powell, Brainerd and Clarida. So I'll be interested to find out what the dynamic is when it comes to inflation risks. At the moment, inflation risks appear to be well anchored. Having said that, if you look at the prices paid data in some of the ISM reports, that does suggest that there is inflationary pressure there, but that could just be simply a case of supply, supply chain constraints and not actually underlying inflation. So it's important to differentiate the two. But certainly that is a risk, absolutely, that the Fed um, could start to get a little bit antsy and think about raising rates in 2023. I think we'd need to see three or four months of 900,000 um, over the summer before we start to have that conversation. But you're dead right um, in terms of what the Fed might start or markets might start to price in in terms of um, rate, you know, the Fed looking to raise rates. So that's a great question, Winston. And it's certainly something that we really do need to think about, particularly if the data continues to come in as well as it has. And certainly, I think three or four months of 900,000 or even a million will start to get market expectations, market starting to price in. So that'll mean that Powell, Powell will need to be very adept at walking that tightrope. I myself don't think that the Fed will be able to stay on hold until 2023. I, th I think it's unrealistic for the Fed to even um, keep rates that low for that long. But you know, say they say a week is a long time in politics, a week is an eternity in markets. So um, things can change very, very quickly. But while this chart here remains stuck below 0.2%, then 
I think the markets will be happy and equity markets will continue to go higher. If we start to break higher, different ball game entirely. So watch the two year. I think that's going to be the key. I think that's going to be the key arbiter of where we go to next. Right, next question. Um, I'll come to copper in a minute, Mark. Um, I'm getting asked about gold. Um, gold for me is very much at the moment, it's a little bit of a sell on rally. Um, at the moment, the gold market is not open. We've seen a little bit of a rebound in the past couple of days. It appears to have found a little bit of a base here. But I think certainly if you're looking at gold prices and you're looking at US 10 year yields, there has been a little bit of a, a seesaw um, relationship between the two. So higher US yields, lower gold. That's been that's been pretty much it. This is where US yields, when US yields were at 0.9% in January, gold was up here. They're at 1.77% now and gold is down here. So for me, look at what 10 year yields are doing, Graham, in terms of gold, because if they continue to move higher, gold will find it very, very difficult to rally. At the moment, we found a bit of a base around about 1670. If that continues to hold, then we could well head back towards 1760. But at the moment, we're in a little bit of a range. If we break through 1.8% on the 10 year yield, US 10 year yield, then gold will probably take out these lows down here and head back to around about these sorts of levels here. So think about the relationship between um, gold and treasury yields, because essentially, why would you buy gold if you can stick your money in a 10 year US treasury and get 1.8 or 2%? All you're then worried about is um, obviously the depreciation of that particular asset. Um, so that's that's gold. I'm being asked about copper. Copper very much is a supply and demand story. So if you think that um, copper prices are going to continue to go up, then you, your 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 thought process is that the global economy is going to continue to recover. But what we've also got to bear in mind with copper is that if we go back to March last year, it's pretty much gone one way. And even though the S&P has continued to move higher, copper hasn't, which suggests to me that maybe we're having a little bit of a pause. But for the time being, I think as long as we're above this 390 area here for copper, then we should move back to 420 and move higher. At the moment, um, I think an awful lot of the reason why copper slowed down was because it got way ahead of its skis in terms of market expectations. We're getting a little bit of a sideways consolidation here, but while above 390, then I think copper prices will continue to move higher. So um, that's what I think with respect to copper. Um, I've got gold and silver again, similar sort of thing with respect to um, what I was telling Graham Thomas. Um, Okay, China A50, why did it go so low? And what's your view now? Cool, dear, don't ask me some easy questions, Alan. Um, the China A50, I mean, that's, that's a tough one. Chinese markets are, are basically a law unto themselves. And I have to say that it's not something that I would probably feel comfortable answering. I would much rather look at, say, the Hang Seng, um, which is a proxy, more of a proxy for China than, say, for example, the A50 is, but certainly in the context of what we've seen over the course of the past few days and weeks, we, we remain very much in an uptrend on the 50, the, Hong, the Hang Seng. And I think while we're above this series of peaks through here, um, we've, we've, re, we've rebounded off there and we're up to 200 day moving average. There's no evidence at the moment that the Hang Seng can't continue to recover. The A50 is not something that I would really want to touch with a barge pole or even offer an opinion on. Sorry about that, Alan. <laughs> um, is there anything else that you'd like me to talk about, ladies and gents? If not, then I'd like to wish you all a happy Easter. Um, I hope um, I hope you the uh, hope you uh, are enjoying your Easter eggs or get to enjoy your Easter eggs. Easter eggs, Japan. Okay, now they're all coming out of the woodwork. OK, um, let me just get rid of the S&P. 
Let me just reset that graph. There we go. Silver. Right. Okay. Let's get a shot of this. Again, we've seen a little bit of a reversal in silver in the same way that we have with gold held above just just a, it's around it's just just about held twenty four dollars yeah we did trade down to twenty three eighty um but overall i think um obviously the dollar the strength of the dollar is going to have a a little bit of a drag on it but overall um given where we are at the moment we're very much in a downtrend the current rebound is probably going to find a little bit of selling pressure between around about twenty six dollars um and in the same way that with with copper i think we're in a range with silver albeit with a slightly downward bias so with with silver i'm very much a case to sell the rally in the same way that i am pretty much with gold if we do get a softening in us yields um you also got to take into account the fact that silver is more of an industrial metal than it is the, than gold so there is a little bit of supply and demand dynamics going on at the moment but the fact that um, we haven't um, been able to sustain that move below the 200 day moving average would appear to suggest that um, if you look at the way silver trades, you know, we've been in a range between 20 and 30 dollars for the past 12 months, and that's likely to continue, I think, going forward. Um, natural gas. Yeah. Right. Sorry, someone's just asked me a series of questions and I've lost the top one. <laughs> okay japan right and gas right gas okay gas um nick a225 where are we well nothing not to like there the nick a225 it's going to be pretty much like everything else um let's get rid of that and let's do a little bit of updated analysis on this. Right, 30,000. So this, this we're, at a, we we're just above 30,000 at the moment. Keep an eye on that peak there in March, which is around about 30,500. Overall, I, I'm as bullish on the Nikkei as I am on the DAX, as I am on the S&P and pretty much everything else. Um, you know, if you're bullish one equity market, generally, that tends to basically translate across to everyone else. But certainly in the context of this move here, if we break above this triangular consolidation here, then we'll probably take out the previous highs and head higher. We're still well short of the record highs in the Nikkei. They're at 40,000 in 1989. I certainly don't think we'll get there yet, but I am certainly fairly bullish on further gains on the Nikkei. And obviously the Nikkei liked that payrolls report as well because Nikkei futures are well up and looking to retest the previous highs from March. Natural gas, where are we? There it is. Again, natural gas is closed today, but um, the thing with natural gas is it tends to be very seasonal and um, in the summer, demand tends to drop off. You're drawing in that line there and it has broken below it, but it's more importantly, it's held above the 200 day moving average. So I think for me, this line is not particularly useful, so I'm not going to use it. What I am going to use is this level here. So you're looking at around about 268 as a bit of a short term resistance. Now, why have I done that? because it happens to coincide with that low there and these peaks around about here. So, and obviously that peak there. So sometimes you'll find that if you drill down into a piece of price action, and let's say for example, let's do this for four hours, it can actually tell you a much better story because you can see that there are a series of lows through here and here and through here as well. So between 270 and 280, there is, what I would call an area of support and resistance that's likely to cap any gains. And that's why sometimes looking at a daily chart 
is useful in terms of a long-term reference frame. But when you drill down into the intraday stuff, that can actually tell you so much more. And certainly in the context of what I'm seeing here is that in terms of natural gas, there's a natural resistance anywhere above 268 to 272. And as such, that could mean that we'll drift back down towards around about 250 and 260. So very much a range trade at the moment with respect to natural gas. So you could see it drift back all the way back to 220 or 230 as demand starts to taper off. Um, that's certainly a very realistic um, point of view to have, so simply on the basis of seasonal factors and when demand drops off. Um, but overall, at the moment, what we've seen is a bit of a resistance here. If that holds, then we could come back down to around about these lows through here. Okay, so hang on a second. Da, 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 da. I'm working my way down, ladies and gents. So I'm really trying to um I wouldn't be <laughs> basically when you talk when you think about shorting a market that's going up the only reason you should be shorting a market that's going up is if you're already long um for me the trend is your friend so if the s p is going up i'm not trying to pick the top never try and pick the top in a rising market same goes for nasdaq uh, and pretty much anything else if a market is in an uptrend you should be looking to buy the dips um, on a market so you need to be selling you need to be buying into weakness and once you're long then selling into that strength to take a profit. Selling into an uptrend is a very dangerous thing to do because how do you know where the top is? Yeah, the, the S&P um, at the moment is around about record highs, but that doesn't mean that it can't go to 4050, 4100. And bear in mind that the market's probably gonna be closing early today and you don't wanna be stuck with a short position over the weekend. Um, because anything can happen over a weekend and it's not something that I like to do and I've been doing this for 30 years. I will only run a position over a weekend um, as a last resort or if it's a very, very long term trade. In terms of a short term trade, I won't do it because the risk reward isn't there. So in terms of shorting a market, only, you know, only short a market if it's in a downtrend and equity markets aren't. You know, you need to sell into strength in a down move in a down moving market, or buy into weakness in an uptrend. It's about it's about mindset. Um, you know, if I tried to pick the top in this bull market over the course of the past 12 years, and there was a time when I did think, oh God, it's come too far. It's got to come off from here, and I've sold into it, and it's carried on going. You know, there is no way of predicting where the top is. So if I'm looking to trade the S&P 500 or any other market for that matter, and I'm looking to trade it, I'm looking for a pullback to 4,000 or these sorts of levels through here um, for a, a move higher. So any weakness towards 4,000 to 39.80, look to buy it for a move back to 44, 40.50, 40.60. Um, same thing with respect to I don't get, the NASDAQ looks a little, little like a drunk trying to find its way home over the last 10 minutes. Well, it is quite thin. Um, and that's what happens in very thin, um, illiquid markets. So um, what level on the 10-year might trigger a sell-off in the rate-sensitive NASDAQ? I'd suggest it would probably need to go through 1.8% on the 10-year. Um, at the moment, we're in a little bit of what I would call a Goldilocks scenario when it comes to US markets. They're juiced up on the back of $1.9 trillion of fiscal stimulus from last month. And also the fact that we're gonna get some infrastructure stimulus coming down the pipe over the course of the next few days as well. So you've got all of that um, and bond yields at the moment around trading just below 1.8%. Um, <clears throat> getting asked DAX late for the rally, blah, blah, blah. Anything, any, all right, I've been asked about the Dow Jones. Dow Jones, S&P 500, NASDAQ, you could throw a blanket over them. Now, the NASDAQ has lagged behind a little bit, 
but what we've seen here now that we're above the 50-day moving average and we're above these series of peaks here means that it's quite likely that we'll probably see a move back to the highs all the way back here now the nasdaq is vulnerable i will agree with you on that point and i will agree with you on the basis that big tech is going to be in the firing line for um, a number of politicians on capitol hill but they're already talking about raising the tax rate from 21 percent to 28 percent which you would think would be negative for the likes of amazon apple alphabet facebook twitter and all of those people who you know who who um would have to pay a high rate of tax but they were paying an even higher rate of tax when trump was made president they were paying 35. he's cut it to 21 and biden wants to raise it to 28. so still seven basis points lower from where it was five years ago so it's all relative um, and yes more regulation might start to hit the business models of certain um big cap tech stocks but um overall um if i allow myself to think in those terms i'm allowing the fundamentals to cloud what the technicals are telling me and then i start to become hesitant and don't make sensible decisions so for me it's about what the price action is doing so in terms of the us 30 it's pretty much the same as the nasdaq and the s p 500 or the dow higher lows higher highs uptrend by the dip if you're getting lower highs lower lows downtrend sell the rally and basically draw a line through the draw a line through the lows in an uptrend quite simply like this helps if i can actually draw them correctly um i need a i need a cup of coffee there we go there we go so in terms of the, the dow we found that it's found support three days in a row all the way through uh, 32,990 so 33,000 give or take which means if we do dip back to 33,000 we'll probably find some buyers it will rebound and it will go higher um, I make it sound that simple because ultimately in terms of risk management it is that simple you find an area of support that you're comfortable with in this case it'll be 33,000 you put your stop loss below these lows not too close mine but low but far enough away that you don't get knocked out on a spike lower so buy at 33,000 with a stop loss below these lows here for a move up to 33,200 400 or what have you you know that's essentially what you're looking for you're looking for series or areas of support or resistance to buy into so in terms of the dow jones it's very much a case of buy the dips um we could see some of this rally over the course of the past hour or so um get shaken out next week but overall um those numbers speak to me to the prospect for higher stock market so dow, dow jones uptrend s p uptrend dax uptrend you know stop trying to pick the tops in these markets they're not you know they're in an uptrend you should be looking to buy the dip with you know a, a fairly you know a fairly decent stop on them because otherwise if you're trying to sell if you're trying to pick the top you're essentially trading against the trend and as i say unless you're long that's generally not a particularly wise thing to do because where do you put your stop loss in an uptrend where a market's trading at record highs you've got no frame of reference because you're trading in uncharted territory so you don't know where to put your stop if you're trading a market from the long side you know where the previous lows are so you put your stop loss below the previous lows does that make sense well i hope it does anyway so let's see 100 i'm going to talk about that well here again uptrend what's frustrating about this particularly with respect to the FTSE is that it's not going it's not getting through 6800 I still think it will in fact I'm convinced it will I think we will retest January highs here and head back towards 7000 but we've got to hold above the 50-day moving average and this trend line support from these lows back in February but what's happening here is indicative 
of a market that wants to go higher because the lows are getting higher. And once they stop um, getting higher, that's when you start to be a little bit cautious. But if we can take out 6,800, and hopefully that will happen next week, then we could well see a revisit of 6,900 and the highs that we saw earlier this year. I tend to look at my analysis very much from a long-term standpoint. So I take the sort of medium to long-term trend and basically take my analysis from that. I think you can trade way too short-term. If you go too, if you go too short-term and you trade a lot, um, you run the risk of picking a load of losers just as much as you do a load of winners. So it's about managing that risk. You'd have to basically trade in a manner that's comfortable for you. Um, one of the mistakes I made when I was a very young junior trader was I tried to copy people that were successful. Um, and sometimes in doing that, I went against my own gut instinct. And actually, my own gut instinct was actually right. But I didn't have the confidence to think that at the time. Um, but once you generate that confidence, that would generally flow all by itself. Um, so I think for me, it's about developing a style that you're comfortable with, finding a market that you like to trade, and then basically just, just just persevering with it. And you will lose money on occasion. Everybody does. The trick is, and it's an important one, is that you keep your losses small and your profits big. And I know it sounds like a bit of a cliche, but that is that's, that's pretty much it. In answer to your question, I am recording this and I will be putting it up on YouTube within the next couple of hours. So you can actually look at it on a later date at the uh, CMC Markets um, YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash CMC Markets PLC. Anyway, that's it, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm going to go and eat some Easter eggs and um, I'm hoping that you are too. So I will wish you all a very happy Easter and um, I look forward to speaking to you all same time, same place in a month's time when we cover the non-farm payrolls numbers yet again. Thanks very much for listening and have a happy Easter.